is um, Dr. Sally McFarlane, and she is the program manager in the Biological and Environmental Research Program Office within the Department of uh, Energy, Office of Science. Dr. McFarlane manages the Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Research Facility, a scientific user facility that provides the climate research community with the observations from fixed and mobile atmospheric observatories to improve understanding of the fundamental processes governing the interactions among aerosols, clouds, precipitation, and radiation. Dr. McFarlane is actively involved in interagency efforts focused on observations. She is currently co-chairs of the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee sub-team on Arctic observations and is a member of the U.S. Global Change Research Program. Interagency Working Group on Observations, the Interagency Coordinating Committee for Airborne Geoscience Research and Applications, and the Interagency Council for Advancing Meteorological Services Committee on Observational Systems. Uh, prior to joining DOE headquarters, Dr. McFarlane was an active research scientist with over 50 peer-reviewed publications focusing on the use of remote sensing observations and radiative transfer models to improve understanding of the radiative effect of clouds and aerosols on the Earth's atmosphere and to evaluate cloud and climate models. Dr. McFarlane is the fellow of the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science. So welcome. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't realize you were going to have to read all of those <laughs> acronyms out. It's all good. I, I haven't shared in Teams before, so I don't, does that presentation yep. look right? Okay. Yes. Looks a little weird on my screen. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so Randy uh, asked me to present um, just kind of, I think, because Department of Energy is sort of a maybe a non -trad traditionally non-aviation agency. So folks might not be aware of some of the activities we do that um, make use of aviation weather or, or might be relevant for aviation weather. So I'm just gonna give a, a brief introduction primarily to my program, which is the Atmospheric Radiation Measurement or ARM user facility, and then um, our sister research program, which is the Atmospheric System Research Program. So um, ARM is a, what we call a, um, user facility within the DOE Office of Science, and that means it's a facility that's freely available to the community for scientific research. And um, the goal of the ARM facility is to provide the research community with long-term in-situ and remote sensing observations of aerosols, clouds, precipitation, and radiation. And the goal is to provide data that can improve the understanding and representation of aerosol and cloud impacts on the radiation budget and climate models. And so our office is focused primarily on understanding processes that are relevant to climate, but of course many atmospheric processes that are of interest to climate are also of interest to weather, so there's a lot of connections there. So ARM has three, um, three fixed observatories in different climate regimes. We also have three mobile facilities for six months to five year deployments, and we have an aerial facility that includes um, with the manned aircraft and unmanned aerial system and tethered balloon systems. All of our data is freely available to the community. Um, and then I did want to mention, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later, there's a sister research program which funds scientists from the academic community and the Nash DOE National Laboratories to use ARM data to study aerosol cloud and radiation processes. And they do have a funding opportunity announcement currently open. So if you are in the academic community, you might want to check that out. Um, this map just shows all of the locations that ARM has done observations over the past um, 25 years. So the red dots are, the, are places where we um, did either a mobile facility campaign or an aircraft campaign, and the green dots are where we are currently doing observations. So each of our ground-based facilities has over um, 50 instruments that range from surface meteorology, radio sons, um, broadband or spectral radiometers, to active remote sensing instruments, including um, salometers, micropulse lidars, Doppler lidars. We have vertically pointing KA band radars at all of our sites and scanning radars at some of our sites. We also do um, aerosol in situ measurements and some surface and precipitation measurements as well. And then regarding our aerial observations, 
We have, um, an, as I mentioned, a manned research aircraft. So for many years, we operated a G1 turboprop aircraft for atmospheric research. We retired that in 2019 and procured a Bombardier Challenger 850 jet, which we are currently modifying for research and we hope to begin deploying for field campaigns in 2023. We have over 60 research instruments that we can fly on the aircraft, including meteorology, aerosol, probes, and cloud probes. Um, we also are doing some work in unmanned systems. So we did some work early on with small UAS. Now we're focusing on this Group 3 UAS, which is a modified Tiger Shark. I will say we have had some challenges with this, but we, <laughs> we think we're making progress now. Um, we have integrated a lot of atmospheric instruments on the aircraft, and we are hoping to do research flights with our aircraft um, next year. But this fall, we have been collaborating with Mississippi State University. Um, they also have several tiger sharks, and we've integrated some of our instruments on their aircraft, and we hope to do flights um, at our Oklahoma site this fall. Finally, for the aerial um, observations, we have several tethered balloon systems. And again, we've flown um, a variety of instruments on those systems to look at aerosol and cloud properties. We've actually flown them in cloud at our site in Aliktok Point, Alaska. And finally, I'll just mention some of the um, types of research activities that we do that might be relevant to aviation weather. So we have um, a very strong research activity in cloud microphysics. Um, in all types of clouds, but we have done a lot of work on mixed phase clouds um, using both radar and aircraft data. Um, well, this isn't really focused on aircraft icing, you know, it's focused on understanding cloud processes and what keeps clouds active for a very long time and, and how they impact their, uh, how the phase impacts the radiation budget. It could presumably be relevant for, um, for icing research. Uh, with our tethered balloon, I mentioned our site in Electoc Point, Alaska. We actually recently did a um, study there on ice fog. And so this picture up here shows the balloon actually operating in the ice fog conditions in Alaska. Um, we have a lot of research that we fund on convection, um, you know, convection initiation and formation. We've done a lot um, in the Oklahoma region where one of our fixed sites is we also did a significant campaign in coordination with NSF in Argentina a few years ago. We had both one of our mobile facilities and our aircraft there and looking at the initiation of orographic convection. Um, this region has some of the most uh, severe thunderstorms in the world and a lot of hail. And then currently one of our mobile facilities is in the Houston area where the focus for that campaign is on aerosol deep convection interactions. And then finally we do um, a lot of boundary layer research as well. Again, this is mostly focused on aerosol, um, understanding aerosols in the boundary layer and cloud formation. However, there is some work on turbulence and some work associated with the low level jet, especially in, in Oklahoma. So uh, that's all I have, just a really quick overview of ARM and DOE's activities. All right, thank and you so much. Um, so that's uh, our three panelists for this session, and um, David is going to take over um, monitoring the questions and uh, facilitating the discussion. All right. Can anyone tell me how to stop sharing? <laughs> uh, I got it. I think right. I got it. <laughs> we can take it away from you. Excellent. Thanks. <laughs> um, and Sally, uh, while you're there, um, I'll just kind of go into reverse order here. Randy Bass just asked a question. Can the jet uh, be used for other flight campaigns or is it reserved purely for DOE purposes? So we do our aircraft, um, our mobile facilities and our aircraft campaigns are proposal based. So anyone from the scientific community can um, submit a proposal um, for those. Um, the aircraft not yet because it's, <laughs> it's not ready, but um, that is the way that we operate it. So we have had um, folks not funded, you know, funded by other agencies, definitely that submit campaign proposals to us. All righty. And uh, Matt was asking, uh, does the ARM, uh, does ARM share its observations in real time with National Weather Service? So we have a few different um, 
collaborations we've done with some folks at NOAA. Um, we do share all of our SON data, goes into GTS, and I think we've done some work um, with various groups in NOAA on some of our data in real time. We don't um, we don't produce all of our data in real time since it's more research oriented, but we can um, produce specific products in, in collaboration with folks. Great, thanks. Um, and uh, this is for uh, Heather, uh, who's had several questions and she's answered most of them online, but one here uh, from Randy Bass. Um, that came in, not to put you on the spot, but uh, if you could talk a little bit about facets and um, warn on forecast initiatives in the Weather Service, and he's going to give you bonus points if you can talk a little bit about those, how those initiatives might translate into aviation support for tracking convection, et cetera. Yeah, well, I want those bonus points. You know I do. Yeah, I was going to um, try to find those for you. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I don't know what I can use them for, but I want them. Okay, so FACETS is an acronym that stands for Forecasting a Continuum of Environmental Threats. And if you're still just as clueless as before I spelled it out, that's welcome to my world. It doesn't mean a lot to me either. It's one of those where somebody is trying too hard to make an acronym that spelled a word. But what it is, is it's this initiative within the National Weather Service and NOAA across the board to transition the National Weather Service over to probabilistic forecasting. And it includes several components. It's this iterative process that starts with um, observations and modeling data, circles on through to the forecast or interpretation of that, the creation of products for an end user, uh, measures the response of the end user, whether it's effective or not, gets into validation and verification, and then the process starts back over. So this is like this endless loop of, of work available. I think it's just all about job security more than anything else. But it is important because probabilistic forecasting provides a more robust solution than a deterministic forecast does. Um, and I know that folks in the aviation community tend to bristle a bit when we start talking about probabilities, but the reality is, and I hope I don't get myself into too much trouble saying this, but the reality is I've seen some of you do it. When I've been to the command center, and you look at the TAF from the AWC, and then you say, well, let's look at United's TAF, that's probabilistic forecasting. You're trying to get a sense of what is the range of possible solutions, and that's what this can give you. Warn on forecast is a subset of facets. It's an ensemble system. It's an on-demand regional forecast, very short range, very targeted for certain kinds of weather. Right now, the emphasis for the team working on warn on forecast is improving the lead time for tornado warnings. But um, this concept could be applied to more than just that. It could be applied to getting a more precise forecast of fog at San Francisco or better forecasts of um, uh, IFR types of conditions at airports, or maybe just wind shifts. When is a wind, a, a gust front from a vicinity thunderstorm going to pass through and change the direction across the runway and maybe have to result in turning the airport around? Or do I need to, to turn the airport around? Because it'll only be for so, um, for so long. Um, okay, so I think, I think I've covered this. I, do I get the bonus points, Randy? Does that cover what you wanted, or um, do I need to talk more to get the points? No, as I said, that's a, that was a much better explanation than I could have given, so I appreciate it. Okay, all right. Well, I'll look for um, cashing in those points at some point in the future. <laughs> There'll be a little extra in your paycheck. Just watch for it. Um, <laughs> if only, if only. Thank you, uh, Heather. And uh, Dan, uh, had a few questions. I think you answered them all on the chat, Dan. I have to say I was very intrigued with especially the volcanic ash product. Um, having flown several thousand hours as an airline pilot between North America and Asia, and uh, one of the events that you showed there, I actually uh, I didn't fly over the region when it erupted, so they had already taken into account, but uh, that's really intriguing stuff. And Sally, I have to say also as an airline pilot, I'm really intrigued to hear about the airplane coming online in 23. But uh, anyway, uh, I think we have one question here that is aimed 
towards all the panelists. Um, from Matt, uh, struck with how relevant your non-aviation R&D is or could be to aviation. Uh, how do we foster necessary collaboration and funding uh, to really supercharge some of the aviation related efforts aside from having TIMS like this? Um, and what role might ICAMS and IMCO play? So I'll just open up to all the panelists there. Uh, this is Dan. Um, so first of all, I, I can't speak to ICAMS and IMCO because I don't know what those are. <laughs> but um, I will say that NESDIS, who I work for in general, is currently really interested in just uh, the very um, general goal of user engagement. And, and I guess what they mean is going out and talking to users or end users of our products or our data and, and finding out from them what their problems are that we could potentially help with. A lot of times uh, researchers for uh, NESDIS researchers in the past have tended to focus on what they want to work on and the, what they think may be useful or may be important. And the idea is maybe we don't really know. Like, what I, To be honest, I don't really know what FAA does exactly. So some sort of meetings where you guys or the, the folks on the call, and, and it, it probably is beyond FAA who's on the call now, could tell us, you know, what, what do you do on a daily basis? What, um, what are the problems that you encounter now that perhaps satellite products could help with? That kind of stuff is really useful for us. So I don't know, maybe having scheduling meetings, one-on-one -on -one meetings with fairly small groups and talking through these types of things uh, would be helpful. I don't know, Matt, if that's really getting at your question or not, but that at least what I said is a true statement. Yeah, and maybe I could add, so I am on the ICAMS observation committee. I, I'm basically the Department of Energy rep to any <laughs> observational related interagency committee. Um, and so I do think that's a good, a good question. I don't really know how or where aviation weather falls within the activities within ICAMS. I don't know whether it falls more in the services committee or observations committee. We are spinning up our subcommittees within observations, one of which is going to be, um, I think, focused on aircraft related observations um, and so maybe that's a place to make that connection also with the the aviation weather services well i'll say something it seems like um it seems like it's not so difficult to get funding to work on death legislation types of research projects and somebody died and so now we need to fix this problem but um leaning forward into novel types of projects that somebody didn't die. It's just maybe a new innovation that might um, streamline things, might add benefit. That's kind of um, kind of hard to find funding for that in the aviation sector. So um, it'd be nice if there was some way to advance those other interests and not be so morbid in our in our priorities not that it isn't worthwhile to fix a problem that causes somebody to die I mean, it really definitely is but um uh, it'd be nice to think what do i want this product to look like in 10 years do i want it to still be the same or is, are there new is there new technology that could be folded in and make it better matt does that um respond to your well, I, I, I heard uh, I heard kind of three three different uh, sort of angles being being taken and and you know I, I guess maybe uh, when Bill and I are having our what did we hear what are the gaps what are the collaboration opportunities you know what are the uh, are the um, 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 overlaps. Um, I, I I sense collaboration opportunities are plenty in 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 this space right here. If we say the right magic words to the right people, and by the way, uh, Dan, for, for you, um, there are there are uh, are people I admire. They may even be on the line, so I better not say anything bad about them. Uh, out at at NOAA's, um, you know, Global Systems. The, the lab, uh, the, the the Stan Benjamin, Steve Wygans, Curtis Alexanders of the world, who do such marvelous, marvelous work on the 
on the you know high resolution numerical weather prediction models that they do and and you know much of that was assisted by not insignificant amounts of funding from the FAA to help advance the aviation arena and yet there have been several times where we have gone and talked with them and said did you know that x and such is of interest to us because of this reason and that reason and 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 often they know but sometimes they don't know and they go wow that's really good information if i we'd have known that we'd have done this thing differently here what i'm hearing from you is hey we here at Nesdis got a lot of cool stuff, but we don't exactly know what your problems are, and we don't want to just throw solutions over the fence that are chasing a problem. We'd rather have a problem we're working on and producing a solution for. Yeah, you nailed it exactly. That's exactly the situation. I mean, I think some of our folks certainly know some of the problems. It's not like we're completely ignorant, but I mean, it's good to keep up with the way things change because a lot of times we're working on products that were requested 10 or 15 years ago and then we'll say here you go and they say oh wait that's not a problem anymore because of such and such so I think it's good to do this regularly um I don't know yearly meetings or something but uh I don't know we, we should we should talk later and schedule some sort of a meeting to get through and figure out a plan well and and uh, sorry I, I do not did not follow my own words and turn my camera on when I was talking I apologize for that um, I, you know, w one of the things that Bill and I are going to be talking about tomorrow is is kind of a next steps or what 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 tangible outcomes do we want to come from these four days? And maybe what you just said, Dan, is is one of those tangible outcomes, whether it's hosted by through FPA and you know, we have a budget of zero. So sometimes doing this can be a little bit uh, challenging for us. But but, you know, maybe it's may, maybe it's ICAMS or, or IMCO, which, Dan, is the replacement for the Office of Federal Coordinator of Meteorology, the, the old OFCM the CM office. So that's uh, here again. See, so we've not had a conversation, you know, a new acronym. So it's all good. So so, you know, maybe that's how it needs to happen going forward is to have a federal aviation weather tem because i'm an aviation guy you know on an annual basis and just let let's exchange information back and forth and see where we are with stuff yeah real, real quick to follow up um i, I would say in we should share information first worry about funding later uh you know if we go in with worried about funding then it you know we sometimes things will just stop but yeah i think that's a great plan and i, th I think we probably can find funding if we need to so i'm not that worried on, on the, that side of things Man, I like you. You're not worried about funding. That's cool beans. Um, Bob Avgen, uh, kind of on the same subject, put something in the chat just now. Um, and Bob, I tell you what, if you're okay, it, it's a uh, rather lengthy, but it, it pertains to the conversation here. So, Bob, would you mind um, capsuling what it is that you are? Uh, articulating without my clumsy reading and then you haven't explained what I just read. Oh, sure. I was hoping you do so everybody would jump on you, oh. Dan. <laughs> um, no, hey, Dan, you, you said something earlier and it, it popped into my head uh, because of the work that, you know, Matt and myself, you know, Mike Robinson, others have worked, um, you know, with enhancements to uh, common support services, whether or next gen weather pro uh, processor, you know, and uh, defining what what is already in the plan to provide various NESDIS products, GOES products, Himawari, et cetera, very other, you know, uh, remote sensing uh, products, uh, you know, for the FAA to kind of as yet to be determined how exactly they're going to be used, you know, and, and potentially integrated. Um, however, in that work, and I, I'm, so, I'm sure there's others, you know, out there in the world that have had a found Hey, we have other GOES products out there, you know, improving, you know, with the ABI and, and, and the capabilities that that, that uh, sensor provides. Um, future stuff that's coming on, you know, for the space weather program that, that I know about separately. But things like that. Um, and it goes to Matt's point about having a, you know, a coordination uh, cycle, you know, and is that coordination cycle solely re remaining within the FAA and the Next Gen Weather Program Office to to, to talk to NWS slash NOAA slash NESDIS about stuff they want, right? 
and you know how to you know how do the needs get uh, uh, exposed? You know, is it a process that okay, we got to put all the all the requests into the next gen weather program, and then they go and deal with it with the NOAA, or you know, are there other means right for us to on others uh, that have interest in and in, in recommendations for use of um, aviation weather products, whether they're NESDES or MRMS, for example, um, that we'd like to be able to um, access. You know, so I think I think it, I'm just pointing out one sort of. Uh, aspect of that coordination that that I've seen so far, but also acknowledging what Matt was saying about hey, it probably wouldn't make sense to have you know sort of a, a more uh, integrative uh, you know exchange to dis to discuss these satellite product needs. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think there's probably multiple avenues out there to collect um, you know to share information and collect needs and things like that. Um, you know, not all of us are tied into things that you're already doing. Um, some some we are, some we're not, I think. So I don't know, I, I just think more more communication in general is good. And, you know, if if you have to talk to four different groups and say the same thing, maybe that's what's needed in order to make sure that everybody gets the message. <laughs> um, I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm really answering what you're getting at or not. No, that's it. It's just I think just just information. You know, we're just just talking here. But I I, I figured I could at least uh, you know put that out there so so that you'll know um, that you know there had there has been some coordination point. But you know I, I think there's more recommendations for additional satellite products that are probably not already in the plan for or FAA already has in their plan. You know, and that there we there's various ways to kind of explore those products and, you know, put up a test bed and pilots to, to use them, you know, or, or evaluate them. So. Yeah, I, I should also say I'm just one little piece of NOAA, of course. And, you know, there's a lot of people that probably are talking to, to you guys already <laughs> that I'm not aware of. So it's just, you know, it's more of ignorance on my part in some cases. Thank you. All right. Um... Yeah, there's one comment here in, in the um, chat. I just can't let go by. Uh, Dave McCarron, um, <clears throat> every forecast is probabilistic. It's just if you tell people that or not, no such thing as deterministic forecast. And and I, I, I have to chuckle, uh, which I'm sure Matt is too. Our, our first boss uh, many years ago um, would be rolling over in his grave right now over probabilistic because he wanted us to either say it's going to rain or not. And uh, but he was also very good at forecasting what it's going to was uh, so he could come along after the fact and uh, tell us what we should have forecasted. But uh, but there, there's a lot of truth in that, uh, that, you know, how often can you say that, that there is 100 uh, percent one way or the other? But anyway, it was a it was a comment that I. I had to. Um, look at so. And Matt just put a, uh, I'm sorry, Sally uh, just put a link in to the DOE Wind Energy Technologies Office. Yeah, uh, Matt had made a comment about, that. Matt had made a comment that there might be some, um, uh, the renewable energy sector might be doing information in cloud forecasting and wind forecasting that might be relevant. So I put in a link to the Wind Energies Technology Office, some semi-familiar with some of their work. Obviously, we have a solar energy technologies office as well. I'm less um, up to date on what they're doing with cloud forecasting right now. And I think that was my brother, Thanks. Matt, also known as Matthias, who put that. Yeah, it was actually. Oh, Matthias, I'm sorry. Who had a <laughs> wrong, Matt. And it seemed that it was a renewable energy Oops. sector yeah, wrong, was Matt. developing <laughs> capabilities such as wind and cloud coverage predictions that could benefit low altitude flight ops. So, you know, it looks like that, that that's a good response. Matthias, did you have uh, in, anything to respond to the response there from uh, Sally? Not particularly, no. I mean, it's it's where I'm coming from is that they clearly do forecast for low uh, altitude wind turbine farms or solar panel uh, in order to manage their grids. They need to understand what is the power uh, production 
that they can achieve at a certain location such that they can balance the grid uh, in, in smart ways. And so there is essentially forecasting capabilities for low altitude related to cloud coverage or winds. And this may be very location specific too, uh, that they are doing for their uh, purpose. Would they be willing to share that for free? Probably not because it's mostly commercial how they are using that, but maybe there will be a way to collaborate and opportunities to to share at some minimum fee, I, I don't know. But there's clearly information there that is relevant for low altitude flight operations. That That's kind of where I'm coming from. Yeah, and I think that the wind energy providers themselves, as you say, would probably not share for free, but um, some of the work that um, labs like the National Renewable Energy Lab are doing to improve wind forecasts to help characterize wind resources, you know, those are research efforts, so they might be more willing to share and more relevant and also relevant. Absolutely. Okay. So, I, if you'd like, I can respond to Brian's comment about CIRA and AWC. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a, Brian, as you know, I think there's a number of CIRA um, employees who actually sit at AWC there in Kansas City. Um, the one thing that I don't have a clear idea of, just me personally, is um, the, I guess, the connection and relative role of AWC versus what FAA, FAA does. Um, so I, it's probably a simple thing. I just, that's something I've never, uh, you know, never quite understood. Yeah. Hey, Dan, I don't know if you can hear me. <clears throat> I was formerly one of those CIRA professionals at the AWC and it was a complicated relationship, but we we ran a lot of the R2O from the FAA into the National Weather Service, especially for uh, gridded modeling fields. Um, but one of the things we were slowly working towards is, you know, Steve Miller or um, <clears throat> some of the other scientists there, they would reach out to us and we would do a lot of internal demos just within our, our own forecasting realm. Um, how much that got out to other users was probably limited, but we were just really starting to try to take advantage of that. Of course, it's also resource dependent. You know, AWC has a very um, limited resource uh, in their scientists and support staff. Um, so we were always kind of battling the push to operations versus what do we have time to really demo scientifically to a lot of the users. Um, but it is an existing resource, and I, th I think Randy um, is well aware of it. And we've done part of the uh, PMRs in the past, uh, we would have days where, uh, you know, Steve Miller would come down from CSU and give demos of all the products to people in the FAA. Um, so I, I think that it's there. I think we're just still seeking kind of the hook to make it more tangible. See, I have one more go back if that's okay. Um, there was a, a question early on in the chat to me asking about the um, the turbulence product if it was available in gridded data sets. And while we were working here, I shot an email over to Tony and he said the answer is yes, it's available in NetCDF format, NetCDF 4, I guess. Um, and it's mapped onto the goes the geostationary projection, the same as our as our imager. So it's a uh, um, Go 16 and 17 unique is sort of a unique projection. You can always remap that onto something more convenient for you. So whoever it was that asked that, if you want more details about that projection and those files, shoot me an email, dan.lindsay at noaa.gov, and I can uh, put you in touch with Tony. Hey, Dan, that's me. That's Bob Avgen. I, I'll do that. I think you have your email from, from other uh, venues, so I'm going to send you that separately. So thank you. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, okay, all the good discussion, Jeff. Uh, we're running about, uh, uh, looks like about 10, 15 minutes ahead. Uh, that's the extent of what's been submitted, at least so far, for questions or discussion items. So, unless, uh, unless somebody has something else there, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. Thank you so much, David, and thank you, panelists. Does anyone have any, uh, other discussion items before we uh, have an, our afternoon break?
I, I did see a agree. comment come in from Steve Weingard um, from Matt and Dan. Uh, wanted to concur on the great utility of the GOES satellite observation products, both for direct use and the observations uh, for model assimilation. GSL is coordinating with Dan and colleagues on the model assimilation effort, and there are many promising GOES products, including, of course, GLM, that will definitely help short range forecasts. And somebody just put a hand up and I think it was Randy. That about teams. I have a little circle with plus 78. It's one of those 78 people. Uh, I think Randy has his hand raised. That's Randy. Randy. Did you have okay. something? Yes, sir. Yeah. Randy. Um, so I wanted to uh, kind of uh, uh, expand a little bit on what uh, Dan was asking about um, regarding that relationship between uh, AWC and FAA. And you know, this actually kind of goes both ways. Um, from a research standpoint, the uh, the aviation weather research program that uh, that falls under me, um, we do that applied research to you know come up with these new you know capabilities and things. A lot of those go to the National Weather Service. Um, used to go directly to AWC. Uh, now they go more towards EMC, but a AWC still has a, a big role to play in that. Uh, if nothing else, they test a lot of that, um, uh, or it's for them. Um, going back, you know, the FAA then takes that, you know, weather data and pulls it into into our different systems. And uh, I know you weren't on here Monday, but Doug Murphy talked about the uh, uh, next gen weather program uh, processor and uh, common support systems weather, which is the comm system that moves that data around or will move it. Um, one of the limiting factors that we have, though, is data comms. Um, you know, satellite data is is a is a monster, um, and getting that to us in the FAA um, it is a problem. Um, we're we're fairly limited in in what we can accept, um, and in reality, we don't have all the you know requirements for a lot of the new capabilities just because they're new capabilities, and. Uh, so we're we're working with uh, the, the program management office on that, but um, one one thing you you may not know about the FAA is we are very slow. Um, uh, some of that is just process. A lot of it is, you know, we can't accept anything that if ninety eight percent of the time it's the greatest product in the world, but two percent of the time it causes catastrophic failures. Yeah, you know, we can't do that um because of the safety aspect so we've got to check everything and and that just takes a while so well you guys may be slow but i think we might be slower um we are like for example the the products that we're putting into operations now were conceived in the in the late 90s and we had to wait to build the the instruments and build the satellites and get them launched and et cetera. Et cetera. so anyway we understand slow <laughs> and and just a quick uh replying to steve wygant's comment uh Steve, I, I didn't look at the guest list to even see that you were on, so I'm glad to see that you're here. And yeah, Steve is right. We work closely with GSL. And actually, he reminded me, I, I failed to mention GLM at all when I was speaking earlier. GLM is the geostationary lightning mapper, uh, you know, relatively new instrument in geo orbit. We're able to monitor uh, lightning activity over uh, a large area from goes east and goes west constantly. And uh, this is, I, I mean, I suspect this information might be useful for pilots who are flying out, especially over the ocean, where you may not have other lightning information, you know, to avoid convection and things like that. But anyway, that's something that uh, we should probably look into some more. And if I can take a minute, I just want to say again, thanks, Dan, for all the great products you produce. I think there are a lot of great aviation applications, you know, as I said in there, both direct use and then in the models and, and it dovetails well with the with the high refresh rate because of you know the the way the goes is so we, we think there's a lot there and and again we're already you know we've already used cloud products for a long time and the glm um will be in with the rapid refresh and, and there's lots of other things you all are um putting together that we think have a lot of potential for aviation applications Uh, Day Strand, this is this is Matt. Can can I ask a question of Sally if she's still with us? Uh, I see Sally still there. Okay, 
Hi, Sally. Um, I, I probably was not paying attention. You probably stated it very explicitly, and I was multitasking and doing stuff like that. But how many of those UASs and how many of those fixed wings, et cetera, et cetera, do you guys have? Um, technically, just one of each, although we did recently actually get an interagency transfer from um, DOD of some additional tiger shark um, I don't want to say pieces because I think actually some of them are complete aircraft, um, but we only have one that that we will kind of uh, instrument for, for atmospheric research and the others will be for training or um, parts. Okay, and, and the reason that I was asking you about that actually refers back to a question that, that I put in there about sharing data in real time mm. with the National Weather Service. And what I was thinking was, gee, maybe DOE's got a whole fleet of these things flying <laughs> around, and you know, if they're if they're out outfitted with sensors and 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 you're you're doing real time observing, you know, th this is kind of a nirvana end state, right, for for those in the modeling industry to get crowdsourced, you know, near continuous weather observations from various levels of the atmosphere. So I thought that the Steve Wygants and Curtis Alexanders of the world might want it, but if it's one, maybe that's not quite as important. <laughs> yeah, probably a little less. <laughs> Sally, though, based on what you just said, you had mentioned earlier that you had some work with uh, uh, the drones at, and I apologize if anybody's from either one, either Mississippi State or University of Mississippi or Southern Miss, one of those Mississippi schools uh, that, that you were uh, doing some some uh, work with their drones. So is that just kind of on a one off or is that supporting them in something or it's not really used in, in feeding information back to you all in the same way that you're one or, you know, in the way that Matt's describing there that, that right. might provide more data? So it's sort of a, um, a relationship that we developed on an interim basis. I mentioned we were having some issues with our aircraft, so we had actually modified our aircraft um, a bit from the original uh, Tiger Shark standard, and we ended up having some issues with the landings um, based on some of those modifications. And so we've been working with the manufacturer to address that. But meantime, while we were sort of grounded because of that, our aerial group developed this collaboration with Mississippi State, who were flying Tiger Sharks as part of their um, and I, I won't remember the, the right name of the program, but they had a, an effort in doing that. And so they were doing it as part of their aeronautics program, I believe. And so we brought in the atmospheric instrumentation and have been working with them on integrating some of our um, equipment onto their aircraft and testing out some of the um, ways that we hope to do research flights with um, like staggered visual observers and how, and how that will work. And so. That's kind of what we're hoping to test this fall in Oklahoma. Good. Well, Ms. Pilot, landings is not something you want to have trouble with, so. No, uh, no. Even with an unmanned aircraft. It's that's not, right. Not, not uh, Jeff, if I may, there was uh, one or maybe two additional came in since we're running a couple minutes ahead. Um, yeah, go ahead. And I'm sorry, I'm going to mispronounce this name terribly. Apurva Bajaj? It's for Heather. What are the different federal agencies that are currently using the uh, MRMS products? Um, yeah, MRMS is used by the National Weather Service for decision support by um, all of the NSEP service centers and within all of the um, weather forecast offices. It's uh, streamed uh, many of the products by satellite, um, all of the products by LDM. Um, out that way. It's also used for data assimilation in the RAP and HER models. So it's the, um, the data source of record for the yeah. It's used for model validation um, within EMC for um, post analysis. Outside of the National Weather Service, FEMA uses it for disaster response and planning. Um, it's also been used by the Department of Interior um, for some of their um, management types of things. We know there's some local water resource management um, use of MRMS. It's uh, one of our mosaics is in the FISB stream for radar. So it's used for that as well. Uh, it, it is publicly available. So I know there's quite a few um, agencies outside of um, the federal government that use it. Some 
So private sector entities are downloading the data and using it. I think Delta Airlines has started using it. Um, so there's quite a few. We, I, I don't know offhand the full list of everybody that's using it. We um, have uh, some applications being used by the Department of Defense. The Air Force in particular has some some uh, some of our stuff is being used for that, particularly our domains outside of the CONUS, like Korea, Guam, um, uh, Hawaii, and the Caribbean. All right, very good. Um, let's see. And Sally put a, a link in to the uh, Mississippi State uh, activities there. So um, everyone can check that out. And um, anyway, Jeff, I'll give it back to you here. We're down to about five minutes and uh, and uh, looks like that's uh, the last of the questions. All right, great, great panel, great questions, uh, great discussion. So uh, thank you everyone. We're gonna uh, reconvene at uh, 2.50 uh, Eastern time and have our uh, final session on aviation weather in the future. So I'll see everyone in about 15 minutes. Hello, everyone. It's um, 2.50 Eastern time. We get started in our last session. Looks like we have all of our uh, panelists online. And we're going to start off with uh, um, Mike Emanuel. Mr. Emanuel has been supporting the enactment of principal systems for the FAA for over 23 years in the areas of engineering acquisition and project management. He currently leads the terminal precipitation on the last project. The cloud services for aviation weather project co-chairs with the National Weather Service and United States Air Force um, International Agency for advancing meteorological services, uh, future weather radar working group and it's the cross agency system engineering lead for the spectrum efficient national surveillance radar program during his tenure with the faa mr emmanuel has supported the solution of implementation of multiple elements of the national airspace including weather capabilities such as the level wind shear alert system runway visual range and the asos controller equipment interface display system and the eddy dissipation rate performance standards um, He's the Federal Acquisition Institute and Project Management Level 3 certified and holds a BS in Information and Computer Science from Stockton and an ME in Systems Engineering from Stevens Institute of Technology. Welcome, Mike, to the panel, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeffrey. That was poetry. Um, uh, thank you all for allowing me to uh, share some time with you. Uh, to speak uh, about some of the emerging concepts that we're starting to explore uh, within the FAA. Uh, in particular, one that is uh, exciting uh, is our uh, initiative we've dubbed the Cloud Services for Aviation Weather, or Seesaw. Um, what we are starting to explore uh, is, is the opportunities that um, the cloud uh, environment offers in terms of delivering new weather information uh, to various users of the national airspace system. So the thought here is, right, we can um, provide uh, for the dissemination of data, the processing of data, um, uh, without necessarily provisioning new hardware. Uh, and so that we believe will um, be advantageous uh, in terms of rolling out new capabilities, right? We don't necessarily need a monolithic uh, system uh, acquisition effort uh, to deploy new capabilities, or maybe we leverage existing infrastructure that uh, provides for some degree of uh, service and, and product delivery, uh, but maybe not the totality of all that is needed. So instead of um, uh, taking advantage or, or manipulating uh, those configurations, deploying new hardware, um, we can um, utilize the cloud uh, as a means uh, for service delivery. So, you know, the 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 advantages, you know, include um, 
um, um, sort of the scalability, right? Then uh, the, the the cloud environment itself is extensible and scalable, um, and and uh, there are recurring cost advantages uh, in terms of uh, um, paying for what you utilize, right? Um, though there are certainly uh, other considerations around um, uh, security, obviously um, that that uh, that need to be taken into account. But what I'm really excited about uh, and why I reached out to Randy uh, Bass around this particular topic is, you know, the the enterprise for weather dissemination uh, obviously is not ex exclusive to the FAA aviation weather, not exclusive to the FAA. Um, there's a whole host of uh, not only federal, but but commercial entities that um, that uh, have a requirement right to to utilize this data. Um, we are all starting to explore the cloud. We are all utilizing very similar observation systems, right? Be it uh, the ADAD network uh, or the different modeling capabilities that the Weather Service has or the, uh, the terminal Doppler weather radars that we have, uh, in situ type data that the aircraft platforms might be providing. All this data is, is kind of shared. Uh, and we're all similarly starting to explore the cloud environment and, and wouldn't it be desirable for a federal enterprise approach um, to uh, utilizing this platform uh, wherein we all kind of have the same inputs uh, or similar inputs um, but we all maybe have different uh, processing requirements where uh, we then kind of do our own specific um, uh, manipulation of, of the data. Uh, so um, again, I wanted to just kind of uh, thank the the forum here for allowing me to kind of share some of my thoughts. Uh, hopefully, uh, we have some good discussion. Um, uh, I, I haven't coordinated any of this with any of my leadership, so uh, anything I have to say is is purely my opinion and, and my uh, my desire. But uh, you know, when you think about uh, what ICAMS is doing and and sort of the um, they have a a cloud computing uh, subcommittee within that structure. Right again, uh, Air Force, Weather Service, FAA is starting to explore the cloud. As others, um, you know, can we approach this as a federal enterprise and and maximize the the opportunity that this this technology has to offer? So, Jeff, those were my opening remarks. Uh, I guess I'll yield back for the other panelists' introductions. Thank you, Michael. Um, next, we have uh, Lieutenant Colonel Robert. Um, Branham. And uh, thank go ahead. Uh, do, you, do you have something else to say? <laughs> oh, I'm just going to uh, introduce your uh, bio. I'll just uh, read the first paragraph, but you have uh, quite an extensive uh, background. <laughs> um, Lieutenant Colonel uh, uh, Robert Branham is the uh, Chief Weather Branch Air Force Operations Group, uh, Director of Current Operations, Deputy Chief of Staff. Um, DCH, Operations HAF, Pentagon, Washington, D.C. He leads the annual production of over 2,500 staff weather products supporting the Secretary of the Air Force and Army, Chief of Staff of the Air Force and Army and other DOD senior leaders. Further, he leads the integration of climate and weather intelligence to inform strategic planning and mission readiness courses of action for senior DOD leaders. And he uh, leads the integration of weather and environmental assessments supporting the Joint Staff National Military Command Center, Air Force, and Army Crisis Action Teams. Finally, Lieutenant Colonel Ranham leads the assessment of weather and environment at impacts um, to global military operations. And uh, another um, couple of decades of service. So uh, welcome to the panel and the floor is yours. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much uh, for that uh, introduction, and I want to thank the team for for uh, providing this opportunity for me to participate in this panel this week. It has been a lot of great discussions, uh, and for this particular panel here, uh, I know Mike has, you know, I mean, touched on a good bit of it already. Uh, as I was walking through this and, and kind of talking through, a, I really surmised, you know, three questions. Uh, I mean, here today and you know, really kind of focusing on, you know, what future data sources and communication methods as a federal weather enterprise should we be really looking at? And 
when we talk about future data sources, I mean, there's a lot of information out there today, particularly here in the CONUS. Um, in the DOD, obviously, we're focused on a global perspective. Uh, we are, you know, just not concerned about what's going on here uh, in the states. Uh, we're even more concerned uh, about what's going overseas, and I think that's that's a challenge in itself, right? I mean, we're talking about you know uh, interagency perspectives and kind of talking through that, and I'll get to a little bit of that. I mean, here in a couple minutes, but. You know, we talk about, you know, really optimizing a sensing grid integration process. And when we're really looking at, you know, data sources, we, in the Air Force, I mean, right now, we're really trying to take a, a, an holistic look at terrestrial, you know, capabilities coupled with SBIM capabilities together to meet the full package. You know, you can't just look at, you know, one entity and, and forget about the other, you know, when you're trying to, you know, fill the gaps. Uh, providing support. Uh, as an example for us, we're trying to plug into a program called JADC2, uh, which is a joint, you know, integrated, you know, platform to where we can look at, you know, integrating our data and and really that's where it's at today. It's about getting data integration um, on common operating platforms uh, to support the warfighter from a DOD perspective. Um, and I think you know, a, a question that I'll pose to the team here. <laughs> I mean, obviously, we're gonna have a lot of questions, I think, but um, it, you know, is there a point where there's a degree of oversaturation of data? OK, and how do we develop a long term management practice to ensure that we have the most timely act, you know, timely, actionable and relevant data for a given operation or you know, mission that we're supporting? I, I think going forward and looking at different data types, uh, whether it be terrestrial space, um, you know, we, uh, throw in some AI and machine learning there, which you know, the Air Force is getting into today uh, quite a bit, quite frankly. As a matter of fact, I think we've talked about that some in the last few days uh, with the, the offshore precipitation capability with the FAA. And of course, the Air Force has been working very closely with MIT Lincoln Labs with a global synthetic weather radar capability, uh, particularly for our OCONUS support missions. And, you know, um, Mike had mentioned previously talking about the cloud. Yes, absolutely. On the Air Force side, we are looking at that right now. Uh, obviously, the focus I had mentioned previously talking about the op the optimization of that sensor, that sensing grid integration, even more importantly too, is the efficiencies with data centers. Uh, as an example, in the Air Force, you know, we got six operational weather squadrons, and we have a, a unique weather squadron in the, in the 14th down at Asheville that has a lot of data uh, on the historical side for climatology. Uh, and then we've got our, really what we call the engine room, second weather group out at Offutt Air Force Base uh, there at the 557th Weather Wing. And we're, we've got a plan in place to, to start that, you know, that migration, you know, process of going to the cloud uh, from, you know, calendar year 22 through 24, uh, kind of taking, taking an enterprise perspective at doing this. Um, and, you know, something that's very important to us on the DOD side, and I think it's worth noting here, certainly is, you know, we have to be able to operate on different security enclaves. You know, we can't uh, just just operate on our standard Internet, you know, Nippernet capability we have in our home here or, you know, in our office back at, you know, wherever we're sitting at. We have to be able to, you know, operate on that, you know, secret and top secret level. So uh, that's a very important consideration for the DOD going forward. Uh, we talk a little bit about cloud commute, uh, computing. I think that's an important area that we're looking at right now, particularly as it aligns with the national defense strategy. And, you know, th that's our backbone and really our, when we look at requirements, we've talked, and I think I mentioned this a couple of days ago, actually, uh, in you know one of the forums, but, you know, we talk about, you know, building requirements. Well, you know, for the Air Force and, you know, for the DOD at large, it, it, it's got to be tied back to national defense strategy. Uh, if it's not, uh, you know, a good luck getting funding for it, <laughs> pretty much is what we're saying here. And I, I think that's an important thing to look at. 
Uh, obviously, we want to really work on those partnerships too. You know, we're looking to engage NOAA uh, through uh, the ICAM structure. Uh, currently, uh, you know, formerly, you know, Thick Miser, which you know they had the uh, the Copsy network, you know, located underneath that. Copsy's transferred over to ICAMS now. That's a enterprise-wide data sharing community that's still intact uh, under the ICAMS network. Uh, as Mike mentioned previously, the cloud's going to enable that rapid, scalable solution space for us to engage emerging requirements and challenges. So I think that's. That's a focus for us where we're really trying to push to get uh, into the cloud. Um, one of our big challenges that we have with data processing, um, particularly in a cyber contested environment, includes that edge computing and edge data fields, particularly with these 5G uh, local networks that are out there now. Uh, we are certainly open to discussion for a federal weather cloud solution. Some challenges with that, as you might expect, um, you know, uh, defensibility, obviously in a cyber contested environment is something for us to think about a little bit. And, you know, we also, you know, we're taking a look at it. I mean, obviously, you know, when it comes to paying the bills, I mean, it, it, with anything else, you know, in a case like that, how does that look in a programmatic environment and, you know, from a palm perspective going forward? Um, something that I would suggest to the group here going forth and, and you know, really for ICAMS, quite frankly, I, I think, um, you know, uh, a perspective that I thought about is the next gen numerical weather prediction uh, and data assimilation, uh, data analytic algorithms, kind of focusing on that big data, uh, AI machine learning, seasonal, subseasonal forecasting. Uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. Uh, in my former job, uh, before I came over to be the branch chief for the AFOG weather team, uh, I spent a lot of time with climate change. Uh, and I'm still plugged into it. I, I can't leave it. <laughs> so I've been really kind of, you know, I mean, really kind of staying plugged into the groups here. But, but it, you know, um, in the DAF, our installations are critical to what we do uh, when it comes to the national defense strategy. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, and... The DAF and really DOD now, they, I mean, they've taken a priority look at this climate change issue, and there's two areas that we're looking at focused on climate change, mitigation and adaptation. And I think for us here, and when we're talking about climate change and its impact on aviation operations, I suggest we think of climate change from those concepts as we apply it uh, to support the aviation ops. And talk about mitigation we're talking about you know fuel emissions things of that nature um, adaptation we're talking about policies we're talking about practices what do we do uh, at the local level to, to to help provide better weather support to help better integrate that weather data right um, and I'll give you an example you know as I go through some of this real quick here you know, like, you know, the aviation uh, you know, community, the Air Force uses 80, over 80% 80 of the energy budget, um, you know, um, on fuel expenditures. And it's 45% of the DOD uh, when it comes to energy use. That's a big, big, you know, number there. So think about what the Air Force is looking at when it comes to climate change. Fuel savings, right? Well, I mean, we can, I mean, we can probably, you know, think about that. So from a weather perspective, we're looking at on the Air Force side, how do we get our data better integrated to mission planning, right? It's about getting that, 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 and, and not just data. I, I mean, I think in my, it's my opinion, Rob Branham's opinion, but I think it's, it's more about S2S data, you know, forecasting out in, into, you know, I mean, into, you know, several weeks, uh, if not seasonal patterns for, mission planning, uh, mission planning software, you know, for tankers, refuelers and things of that nature, we can earn our money and, and really make a positive impact there. Um, and, and then that turns into optimizing those operations for the DAF. And that and that's a focus right now that the DAF is working on. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just found out that they're looking at uh, developing a DAF climate strategy, which I think is wonderful <laughs> going forth. Um, last but not least, um, Installation readiness. I mean, we got to have our, our infrastructure at the installation to support flying operations and climate change is heavily being looked at there. Uh, it, over the last several years, we've been updating policies, playbooks, UFCs for our buildings, 
uh, and it's not a cookie cutter you know, a process here. This is an installation by installation approach, and, and we've got to use a number of tools, defense climate assessment tool, uh, 14th weather squadron, uh, you know, CPC at NOAA, you know, you know, different things to help us integrate data into these processes. Uh, as, a, as an example of that, Tyndall Air Force Base uh, is currently in the rebuild process. We've used climate data to establish a more restrictive building design uh, and wind speeds and flood elevation for that particular airfield there. So these are things that I think we should, you know, we talk about these. I hope we have some great discussion here on that. Uh, uh, once again, thank you for this time to participate in this panel this afternoon. I'm excited for our discussion. All right, thank you so much. Uh, next, we have uh, Mark Zettelmoyer, and he works for NOAA's National Weather Service in the Aviation and Space Weather Services branch, serving as a liaison to the FAA Office of Next Gen, the Next Gen Air Transportation System. Mark has a bachelor's and master's degree in meteorology from Penn State and Florida State, and joined the NWS after 27 years in the Air Force where he supported everything from low and slow Army helicopter training to fighters and air mobility operations across the Pacific as one of five next gen par partner agency liaisons to the FAA next gen office of collaboration and messaging. He's engaged in various cross agency issues such as new entrants to the national airspace system, cybersecurity and data exchange. Welcome Mark to the panel and you have the floor. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, hello to my compatriots on the panel. Good to see your faces again. It's been a while. Um, one day, I hope we can all get back together again and talk about some of these issues face to face. Um, like Mike mentioned, um, what I'm going to say is, is my opinion, not necessarily sanctioned by Weather Service and NOAA. Um, but uh, I'll draw on elements of what, what both, of, uh, both of them have talked about. Um, yeah, I work for Bruce Sentwistle. Uh, in the requirements and policy side of the National Weather Service, uh, AFS, Analyzed Forecast Support. Um, but I'm heavily engaged with our Office of Dissemination as we try to evolve our data sharing and data dissemination uh, capabilities, uh, particularly vis-a-vis uh, -vis the FAA and uh, the data sharing with the DOD. So future of aviation, I'm going to emphasize data. And Steve Bradford brought this out yesterday when he said that the future really is a, an infocentric NAS. Um, so when it comes to weather data, are we ever really going to have enough? Uh, no, you know, particularly uh, the government can't do everything when it comes to operations and vision for the future, like advanced air mobility or uh, UAS traffic management. Now, uh, the chief scientist, Steve Bradford, uh, you know, spent a lot of time on PIREPS yesterday. Um, but interestingly, I mean, in my mind, he, he's on the right track. PIREPS today are very manual. But uh, Dave Kochevar's uh, questions afterward kind of led to the path where if we automated a lot of that process, uh, where it wasn't a pilot report, it was an aircraft report. And, you know, what happens if the aircraft is actually a weather sensor? When you look at the uh, AAM concepts, uh, UAS traffic, well, particularly the advanced air mobility operating concept, you're talking about these aircraft in very close core, uh, quarters in a, in, a, in a narrow corridor going back and forth, say from the, the downtown area out to an airport. Um, you're gonna need pretty rapid communications, rapid data ups, updates, you know, not only between the aircraft uh, and their PSU, their provider of services uh, for, for UAM, urban air mobility, but you're probably gonna need the aircraft to aircraft communications too. So if we do things like that, where the aircraft is taking data, disseminating that data instantaneously to the aircraft behind them, I think we immeasurably improve our margin for safety, which is something NASA is exploring through their uh, uh, system-wide, uh, what's it called, system-wide safety assurance uh, is a research effort that they've got underway. So 
Um, frankly, uh, my opinion again, I think the ADSB uh, mandate for equipage for the carriers, you know, in GA as much as they could, might have been a first step. I, I do think, in my opinion again, that when it comes to AAM and, and UTM operations, I think we're going to need to have every aircraft a sensor to fill those data gaps. Um, I think the business case will be there, particularly from a safety uh, perspective. Uh, to make that attractive for businesses to equip aircraft. But that might be the uh, a primary way to make sure we have enough density of information to support those types of operations in the future. So as I was saying, that all has to be machine to machine. Um, first step in that process is ICAO's migration for the international aviation community to IWICSM. That's the IKO Meteorological Information Exchange uh, Data Standard. It's an XML extensible markup language format. It's designed for machine to machine communications. Uh, Weather Service just went live on September 29th with that. So people that access the Weather Service gateway will find TAFs and observations there in the new XML formats. Um, the, ad the advantage is in the future, I don't think the fact that it's, you know, XML or, or GRIB2 or net CDF model data is going to matter a whole lot. Um, the Open Geospatial Consortium uh, has an effort underway. Uh, it's called the Environmental Data Retrieval API, Application Programming Interface. And that capability that they're coming up with a standard for will essentially homogenize data. A user will be able to come into an API, and Weather Service offers a lot of our data now on APIs accessible by the public. Um, but they can come in and they can get GRIB2 data, and they'll be able to get XML data and, and uh, net CDF data. And actually, they'll be able to overlay all these different data types and use the information as they wish. So while we're moving machine to machine, I think we'll also see standards and capabilities evolve that will allow a lot of interoperability of different data types, which will certainly facilitate um, you know, some of this uh, close-in sensing that I've been talking about. And uh, Rob touched on it briefly, all this information. I, have a, I pay attention to aviation cybersecurity also. We're gonna have to bake this into everything we do, uh, cybersecurity. Um, IKO is developing a cybersecurity framework. It'll probably be out in a, in a couple years. Um, but we, you know, I don't know what approach it will take. Will we all need PIV cards? Will biometrics come into play? You know, for users in the NAS, you know, I don't know what it will take account, but we have to protect the information. Uh, there has to be free exchange, but it has to be protected. Uh, so a lot of work to be done in the future, but. Um, like I said, I think if if we open up the data sharing, uh, hopefully the business case is there. I hope the safety case will certainly be there. I think we can make a lot of advances, increase capacity and safety in the NAS for all types of vehicles, no matter who's flying. So uh, that's my thoughts on, on aviation future from a data view. Uh, Jeff, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. And finally, we have um, uh, Donald Eick uh, from the National Transportation Safety Board. Uh, Don is the senior meteorologist for the NTSB and the Operations Operational Factors Group. He's been with the NTSB since 1998, where he provides technical weather analysis and documentation for accident investigations in all modes of transportation. He has been involved in over 1,200 accident cases and hundreds of uh, general aviation accidents. He, he has degrees in aeronautics from Embry-Riddle and in meteorology from Florida State, holds a private pilot and aircraft uh, uh, dispatcher certificate and the NWS certificate. Prior, prior to joining the NTSB, he has a Transworld Airline. He worked at Transworld Airlines as an instructor teaching meteorology Federal Aviation Regulations and Flight Procedures, and Head of Meteorology for the Air Carrier for 14 years. He also taught pilot and dispatch initial training courses at Pan Am Training Institute, Flight Safety International, and other corporate seminars. Welcome to the panel, Donald. 
Well, to to make a summary, basically we've been uh, looking at accident trends. We have seen some improvements, especially in general aviation uh, with glass cockpits and modernization of some aircraft. Uh, air carrier wise, we've been doing uh, a tremendous amount of reducing uh, 121 air carrier accidents to where uh, we're, we're rarely seeing the fatal accidents. I mean, for our last uh, um, major detail was 2018, where we only had four fatalities for a part 121 carriers in the United States. Um, but we do see weather as being significant impact in all phases of aviation. Uh, in general aviation accidents, which can extend from uh, flight instruction, personal business, corporate aircraft, uh, we still see about 23 to 22% of those accidents uh, being weather related or uh, weather as a cause or a factor. Uh, for air carrier accidents, believe it or not, the, um, the weather involvement is actually higher at about 38%. So even though we're seeing lower fatal accidents for the airlines, we do see weather as being a significant impact to airline operations uh, with turbulence being the number one cause of accidents where we cause a serious injury to a passenger or a flight attendant. And it's most often the flight attendant. And we've just uh, recently finished a, a safety study on turbulence, which we looked at all the air carriers and all the government services provided, seeing what we can do to improve that record. But turbulence is still a big uh, impact with air carriers, then adverse wind, winds, um, and, and even in the few rare cases, loss of control in flight due to atmospheric disturbances. Um, we're looking at part 135, which also extends to a large area where it's uh, scheduled small commuter aircraft as well as on demand um, aircraft. And we have seen a little bit slight increase in trends there to where we have been seeing some accidents, weather related, uh, VFR and IMC conditions, uh, controlled flight in the terrain, icing. And uh, we're so we're still back uh, meeting some of the basic uh, hazards being a, an impact to 135 operations. Um, but overall, we we have been seeing some improvements, but weather is still a significant impact uh, to air transportation as well as ground, uh, highway, and so forth, as well as marine. And basically, I'll just fill it in, uh, wait for any questions. Uh, uh, I don't know where you want to go with this. We we don't see any climate change impacts and so forth. We just see uh, some long, long, long road uh, uh, trends with equipment and training as being the most significant features. Thanks so much. Um, so, uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff, excuse me for, for butting in. This is Matt. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, Jim Evans, can you turn your camera off, please? It's not that I don't like looking at you, but since you're not on this panel, we want to leave that bandwidth for the panelists. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and thank you uh, all, all the panelists. Uh, so that's our four panelists. Uh, so that's uh, open the discussion. And um, uh, David, um, uh, go ahead and coordinate the, um, the discussion, please. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Um, Matthias has uh, a question to all the panelists. Uh, if you could have a new sensing capability, what would that be? This is Mike Emanuel. I'll, I'll I'll jump in first. Um, you know, you know I, that's certainly dependent on on sort of the gap and and shortfall that you're looking to address. You know, I think one of the things that uh, some of our analyses have shown is is maybe not so much performance gaps, but sort of spatial gaps, right? You know, not necessarily having the observations and the sensing where you need them. Um, you know, so I think that that that's a harder challenge. 
Um, you know, but with respect to aviation weather, right, you know, obviously, uh, you know, hazardous weather alerting, whether it be convective uh, or wind based um, or, you know, icing, right, you know, having greater awareness in that regard, uh, obviously, is, is always a, a, a desire. Um, but, uh, you know, if there was a if there was a way to proliferate the sensing spatial resolution without, you know, the costs associated with a fleet of sensors, you know, at every grid point, um, you know, that that would be the utopia. Right. Um, but but, uh, you know, that that that's certainly, you know, a bigger challenge, you know, maybe one where, um, you know, uh, sort of, the, uh, you know, derived capability right you know thinking of uh air force's global synthetic weather radar right we don't necessarily have uh an observation sensor uh, in the middle of the ocean or in the middle of the rockies or in theater in in, in the middle east right but we're able to derive per precipitation information um so I'll, I'll 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 start the discussion with that over yeah and this is a lieutenant colonel branham uh, you know of course i i i'll, I'll I'll kind of chime on to what Mike said here. I, I think, you know, for us in, in the Air Force and the DOD, certainly having sensing capabilities um, that, you know, we can keep, I mean, obviously protected from a, from a cybersecurity and then from an OPSEC perspective in other theaters to support the warfighter is more important to us. and. Obviously, global synthetic weather radar was an example of that, but also like having a, a a a capability of understanding. Obviously, you've got you know tactical weather sensors that you can use, like micro weather sensor for a terrestrial observation at a given location. But having the ability to sense the vertical right and to be able to effectively characterize the atmosphere uh, at a given location, you know, uh, we've had numerous discussions in the past about hey do we need to get you know uh you know tactical uh you know um uh tactical you know radio signs and things like that that gets very difficult you know from an oconus perspective on on you know where do you place those you always want stuff that's upstream to give you a the ability to forecast the weather right so i i think for us certainly that, that uh oconus perspective is is, is, you know, where the gaps are going to be. Regards to aircraft, I would, uh, we'd love to see in situ uh, a reporting ETR on all aircraft uh, that can all automatically uh, detect PIREPS, get it into the system, and be able to display it in, in improved in cockpit weather displays. Uh, so that would be the alternate goal to have aircraft doing the sensing, not relying on a pilot to, to call ATC to put it in as a PIR rep so the weather service <laughs> can get the forecast and issue the advisory, have that readily available uh, to everybody. Here, here. <laughs> I mean, that's what I was saying, just different words. Yep. Um, yeah, and, and going back to my discussion about advanced air mobility, urban air mobility, you know, if there were a capability to blanket a city, you know, and, and detect the winds and, and the EDR, the turbulence, uh, you know, which will be the major impacts to air taxi services in the future. Um, that would be ex extremely beneficial to ensure safety for those, you know, first folks taking off on those first flights battling the, uh, the turbulence in the urban canyons. Well, just even, uh, I'll just say, just being able to, to see this from the cockpit side and so forth too, we had a close en encounter um, this more last night, I should say, in Phoenix, where we had uh, an aircraft taking off in a uh, a very significant th underneath a significant thunderstorm cell, encountered a microburst and hail, uh, was damaged and aborted the takeoff and came back, uh, and it was from looking at it from ground based weather radar, clear cut depiction of this. But again, air traffic controllers in the tower don't have weather display like what we see on National Weather Service radars. The pilot could not rely on his airborne radar because he wasn't 
uh, in the air yet, and then even then limitations. And uh, the system basically failed him that he high base thunderstorm in Phoenix and he had the minimums to take off. And luckily it was the sh changing winds that he recognized and stopped a major accident from occurring. And that happened last night or early this morning at, at about 1Z in Phoenix. So these things still occur. Doesn't Phoenix have a terminal Doppler weather radar? They're, they should have yeah, been. That, I, think, I think he got the alert on takeoff, and that's one of the reasons why he aborted. But uh, um, he didn't counter the he didn't counter the microburst and also the hail. So uh, it was a close call. Uh, speaking of sensors, uh, from um, or, or, or new ways to sense weather. Uh, there was a comment that uh, Steve Dar put in the chat uh, that I don't know if you want to comment on it, Don, uh, or not, but uh, the NTSB recently recommended that 121 operators equip um, their ADSB uh, required uh, equipment uh, to broadcast ADSB weather data in rural airspace. And uh, he did put a link <clears throat> to that recommendation 20-30 uh, um, mm. related to it. Uh, and to the EDR parameter, but uh, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. But that link is in the chat. Um, I don't know how much I can add to that right now, but I know we that was kind of one of the things that came about with the, our uh, turbulence study. Um, just trying to 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 get that information and make it available so we can improve the system. And there was a, uh, let me see, um, sometimes the questions get answered after somebody asks a different question. Uh, see if I can head straight here. Uh, Donald, Eric, uh, are the results from the NTSB study that was completed to understand the current impact of turbulence to airlines published in any form? Are the results from the NTSB study that was completed to understand the current impact of turbulence to airlines published in any form? It, it is officially published now. It is on our NTSB webpage. Um, we have made formal recommendations to the FAA as well as the National Weather Service. Um, several of them are um, like the EDR uh, was one of them. Also, uh, we fully support from our study of our uh, over the last several years as well as the accidents we did base it base our current information on that uh, products like the GTG uh, nowcast uh, be pushed up more for operation as we saw in several accident cases that were tied to convection that it provided advance warning to the uh, flight crew that if they had it from the dispatch and pilot perspective, it would have made a difference in the turbulence event. Uh, so we could have prevented some accidents there um also to improve the uh, it's kind of like what heather was talking about with uh, the and i feel old now convective segments being almost 50 years old <laughs> boy i was around with southern airways and so forth but uh we want some improvements in uh, uh, the air mets uh with regards to turbulence too and the fact that most people don't use them because they're too big so we need to see some improvements in how we're dealing with turbulence forecasts and warnings. Um, and just even, um, you know, everyone's using their own type of forecast, be it a TP, uh, uh, their SIGMETs, the National Weather Service SIGMETs. Everyone's using different products and we're not talking to each other, just like uh, the probabilistic forecast that uh, use the National Weather Service TAF, let's see what United's doing. We're seeing the same thing with uh, SIGMETs and AIRMETs from uh, the air carriers. So we need to unify and start looking at the products. And uh, I was even aware of the uh, um, the one turbulence product that was uh, talked about today with the satellite um, until just shortly before. Uh, so, I mean, I, that, that was not even one of my typical products that uh, – we used in the past, and that was from uh, uh, Dan Lindsay's uh, presentation from NESDIS um, with regards to the satellite-based uh, uh, turbulence. Um, 
So all those things were kind of useful. And we even had a turbulence accident just yesterday with uh, three flight attendants uh, injured uh, going into Houston. So uh, these things are occurring daily. Uh, and Joe Bracken <clears throat> just put on the uh, chat the link uh, to NTSB.gov. Uh, I assume that's the uh, uh, document in question there that we were just talking about. So, yeah, I'll um, have to look to, to see if that's correct. But if not, I'll make sure it's it's out there. It is officially out now, published, and uh, National Weather Service and FAA have been uh, have received some of the uh, recommendations that we've made on it. And I'm sorry, Joe, if I just read the, the print underneath your link, NTSB safety research report uh, reference turbulence. So, yeah, that is what it, the, the one's supposed to be uh, pointing to there. So thanks for that, Joe. Um, hey, before we move on, if I could reference a couple small points that Don just made, um, talking about SIGMETs. With the move to IWIXM, we have an opportunity to reshape how we disseminate data. So but there's a lot in the our, at least my <laughs> my part of the community uh, looking forward to doing away with bulletins. Um, the advantage of IWIXM is you're not going to need WMO IDs. You'll be able to search on the metadata associated with, say, an observation or a SIGMET. And so a, con a data consumer will be able to say, I'm flying point A to point B, and then he can subscribe to information that applies along his using this EDR I was talking about. And what the communication system, the web service should provide is, you know, a SIGMET, one polygon, one message, he gets just what he needs for OBS, SIGMETs, anything he needs along his route of flight. So he doesn't get overwhelmed, you know, looking at this volume of data. He should still, has a, should still have something in his flight management system that can process that. When you look at capabilities like NASA ha has built, like DWR, the dynamic weather routes, no, you know, not just convection, expand that to icing and turbulence, you know, where an aircraft can re reroute around these hazards. Um, so I think using information in the future, getting tailored what you need will be a lot easier in the future. Yeah, and something that I'll bring up here too, and it kind of goes back to, to your point, Mark, a little bit ago, and then somebody mentioned here briefly, on uh, actually Matt uh, talking about the use of, of sensor data from aircraft that that I was part of a, a uh, study on some of that in my former job uh, kind of digging in a little bit to see you know you know where we're at with that 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 is an area that, that we certainly want to dig deeper into on the Air Force side uh, of utilizing sensors that are on aircraft. Uh, obviously, I think that's I think that's a data area, not only from the DOD perspective, but even from the airlines and everywhere else to where we can actually have a lot more real time data uh, I mean, in the vertical. Right. And how do we how do we get that shared across the agencies? I mean, I mean, that's a that's a great question, um, but uh, it, it, it's. It's definitely something that, that, in my opinion, right now, we have a lack of. Yeah, there was a paper from the uh, AMS conference last year that uh, coincidentally, Matt and Matthias, our fearless uh, co-chairs here, uh, presented along with some others, and there's a link to that in the uh, chat uh, as well. OK, um, any other questions or discussion for our panel? You mentioned Southern Airlines, uh, Don. Was that the uh, one that had the hailstorm hit the hail outside of Atlanta back in? Yeah, in the windshields. And that that's yep. the one that basically really we found that uh, uh, they didn't have uh, the convective segment well, they didn't have convective segments. They just had them segments back then. But we uh, wanted to, to to enhance that hazard to have a separate report. So the FAA and the Weather Service came up with the convective segment and then the Center Weather Service unit from those accidents. And hey, just as a point, you look at the major improvements we've had in the, in uh, weather um, sensors and so forth. 
a lot of them came from major accidents. So uh, we have the Doppler from microburst events. We have uh, um, the LWAS and the, the TDWR from the microburst events. Um, and uh, all these events that tend to, to make some improvements in getting groups together. And how long did it take to get FA to get uh, weather displays on a controller screen? That took a, a nexus of 10 years. So it wasn't until the 80s that they had it on their scope. And then it took several accidents, such as the Scott Crossfield accident, to where uh, we, we basically put the procedure in that you just don't look it at your scope. You tell the pilot that he's about ready to fly into uh, the activity. And that that in itself has reduced uh, convective accidents dramatically. Uh, just uh, being able to prov provide that information on the scope, tell the controller to use it, advise the flight crew in case he's not aware of it because there are limitations on airborne weather radar and uh, to prevent the, the incidents and make sure everyone's on the same page. Uh, we just hope with turbulence because uh, you know, controllers don't have turbulence on their screen unless it's convective related. And uh, they have to rely on paper to, to get the advisories to let them know, hey, there's a, a SIG met for turbulence or an air met for turbulence. We need to start soliciting PIREPs. And when we're getting rid of uh, air, the text format, we don't have any way to communicate that data to the controller. So we're looking at improvements and even con controller display just for turbulence so they can be aware of what's out there and to start soliciting and providing that information. And it goes back to even this. I remember working the United Airlines uh, turbulence case out of, off the Pacific where uh, they encountered the turbulence and uh, killed the one passenger and seriously injured 37. There was an aircraft ahead of him who encountered the turbulence first oh, and gosh. didn't tell anybody. They sent it back to the airline as their proprietary turbulence report, um, but they didn't tell the aircraft behind them. United encountered it, and when they encountered it, they reported it on frequency, and there was another airplane directly behind them that attributed United's PIREP that prevented their aircraft from encountering the same type of uh, turbulence and injuries. So uh, it's a matter of getting this information out to everyone, not keeping it proprietary and increasing that situational awareness. Nothing like shared information. Um, That's it. Yeah, I, I remember the Southern Airlines well, because that was my very first day on the job at Delta going into the meteorology department, fresh out of grad school. And I thought, why, this is an exciting industry, but, uh, and it was literally just a stone's throw uh, from where uh, Matt's house is. So uh, he, he wasn't quite down to the Met department yet, but we remember that well. Um, Jim Evans uh, asked a question about the fact that Phoenix has a TDWR and it was, uh, that would display the uh, microburst shapes on the tower situation display. Was the TDWR in operation on October 6th, uh, do we know? I believe it is, is we're just we're just looking at the, we got the event this morning. Um, it was just an incident so far. Uh, we don't know if it's brought up to an accident. Uh, one of the frustrations I have is I don't have access to that information. Uh, so I'll have to reach out to the FA and, um, and MIT and say, hey, uh, you know, can I get a, 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 a an image of uh, uh, the it was display at the time because we don't have uh, uh, live access to it or archive, so we've got to get it from the FAA. But uh, I believe it was, and until they get reached up into an accident, it's just another daily incident that's occurred. And, and one of those reasons is. Um... What Matthias has just uh, asked to all the panelists, um, as, it, as it comes down to many times, lots of things that we talked about today that need to get done. Do we have enough money or do those things uh, or how we can improve leveraging and uh, achieving more through collaboration? 
any visionary suggestions? I guess if it didn't come down to money, that maybe some of these things would have occurred way earlier. But um, like I said, sometimes it takes events, unfortunately, to uh, uh, make things uh, happen. There well, is I, Ian, Ian from Wittig. Um, I, actually, I actually think that um, there could be some form of collaboration. We just need to start talking to each other because um, sometimes Another agency or even within the FAA may be doing something similar to what we're doing, but we're not talking to each other. So I think um, if we start talking to each other, we're working towards the same goal. I, I'm hoping that's what we're doing. Um, then we can pull our resources together and money would not be an option or a problem because, you know, the more people put money in the pot, then the less one agency or one program has to spend. So I think that's something, and the Wittick program has been doing, trying to do that a lot, working across the board. So I think if we were able to do that, I think um, we'd be able to get where we need to be. That's just my thoughts and suggestions. Thank you. So this is Mike Emanuel, right? Again, this is aviation weather for the future, right? So we might have an opportunity here, right, to kind of rethink uh, our, our collaboration, where obviously there's some degree of collaboration amongst the entities, again, government and and, and commercial, um, which may or may not have been sufficient. Uh, so, so there's an opportunity here. You know, I think funding is always challenged, right? We all know that. Um, and, and there's always competing priorities, not just within the weather community, right? Um, you know, a, a new weather observation system or fuel for aircraft, right? Or a fighter versus a tanker, right? You know, there's there's always there's always budgets that that um, you know have competing priorities. But where we have an opportunity, right, is to not stovepipe, to identify where we have a mutual shared interest, where we have mutual shared capabilities and needs, uh, and then socialize those, right? Not only through forums like this, but but also in, in other entities, whether it's ICAMS or, or some other multi-agency uh, collaborative uh, entity and, um, you know, staying unified, right, staying consistent, um, identifying the benefits, right, both operationally and monetarily, right, and, you know, it's not always the, 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 the thing to kind of dwell on, particularly when we're talking about safety of life type missions, but, you know, at the end of the day, often decisions come down to the bottom line. Um, so, you know, there, there needs to be a commitment, right, at, at, at all levels of our, our organizations uh, to, to be willing to, to collaborate and share. And, 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 and that's not easy, right? You know, coming up with a governance structure where one organization's mission is competing against another's is, 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 is going to create, you know, controversy and conflict. But, you know, at the end of the day, if we all kind of keep that mentality right of, of the greater good and and leveraging where we all can provide benefit and value there there, there might be an opportunity there for for success as we rethink right aviation weather for the future over i'll chime in a little bit there and, and absolutely agree with mike's what mike said um but particularly where we can leverage uh across the board freely is is open standards you know, I, uh, IWIXM is an open standard that uh, IKO has developed in conjunction with WMO, who has done the, the technical development. Um, my, my larger point is I mentioned Open Geospatial Consortium. They, they've come up with standards. Uh, Don Birchoff's group is developing the standards for uh, UTM and advanced air mobility. Um, so those are open forum where people can participate, participate you get your input in, and then I hopefully what emerges from all these activities is a standard that will facilitate interoperability across industry and across government agencies. And that way you can leverage work of others. And so I would encourage participation in forums like, like Don's uh, ASTM group F38, you know, or, or stay abreast of what's happening in o OGC with open standards and open source software that's being developed that you can use to facilitate that that interoperability and leveraging the work of others. Uh, 
Um, we've got about uh, five minutes left here. We did have one more question come in. I assume this is uh, uh, for Don. Uh, it's from uh, Gabriel Hendrick. You said that the weather is involved in a lot of accidents, but how much is it responsible for the accident versus something else like pilot error or defective material, or is it possible to say? And I don't know if you have any uh, off the top of your head statistics on that. I'm sure it varies greatly according to the type of uh, flight. And uh, yeah, it 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 does vary. Um, yeah, again, we see, again, we have the man, the machine, and the environment interaction. So you don't see too many weather, uh, weather is coming out as the, the cause of the accident was weather. Uh, it's usually a combination of the, the man, equipment, operating in the environment. So it's the pilot flying the aircraft too close to convection or in the clouds and into icing conditions and not making the appropriate actions. Um, and again, pre-flight briefing, um, we, we we talked a little bit even yesterday at the beginning of the week uh, on Monday and Tuesday talking about how we've enhanced uh, um, the pre-flight planning uh, with the advisory circular. We, we still see 40% of our pilots not getting an adequate briefing uh, and contributing into them flying VFR and IMC or into icing conditions or into forecasted conditions. So it all depends on the on the, the area and the impact, but uh, it's a matter of knowing your environment and taking appropriate plans when you interact with it. Um, but again, it's like uh, all aircraft are having issues. So it's, um, you know, it all depends on the situation that, that they're flying into, but uh, Weather is still a significant factor, and like I said, uh, it accounts for 22% of uh, general aviation accidents. In the air carrier world, it's as high as 38%. Uh, you don't see the fatal of accidents occurring with the air carriers, but uh, that turbulence is an invisible uh, uh, contribution. Adverse winds taking off and landing with crosswinds and tailwinds and causing overruns and that those can be significant impacts. We just had an accident up in uh, Provincetown, um, Cape Cod, Massachusetts with uh, uh, a 135 operation landing in heavy rain associated behind a line of strong thunderstorms with a tailwind contaminated runway. Uh, and that tailwind did basically help, didn't help them stop and overran the airport and injured six people seriously. So um, it's impacting day to day, depending on the operation. Um, and out of about 1300 accidents a year, weather is a, a big factor uh, in those events. You know, you mentioned pre-flight um, and, and my roots were part 91 GA, but I, I was in the 121 world for so long now that I'm a little removed from uh, the 91 current way they the things are done. But back in the day, they used to have a weather briefing and it was through flight service and, and it was easy to see. Yes, they've got one now uh, with so many uh, uh, cloud sources of weather information, whether it's packaged through something like a four flight or something or um, or just looking at weather.gov or the AWC site. Um, I, I would argue that it, it's it's easier and there's probably more uh, volume of weather information available and maybe even assessed than there was back, you know, when I was first starting to fly in the, um, <clears throat> well, a long time ago. And mm. I'm, I'm wondering if that is something that is easily uh, ascertained uh, in, in an incident or accident by the NTSB because it's not just like, well, they logged a phone call with the flight service. N now it's like, well, we don't really, do we really know what they looked at or how well, well brief they might have been? That's that's the hard part of our investigation is uh, there's only several of those sites that record any contact. Uh, the contract flight service station, Lidos, does record any contact. Flight uh, for flight does record some. Um, there's flightplan.com does record some. 
uh, but we'll we'll reach out to those users. Um, but we don't know if it's uh, you know we see a lot of cases. The guy who looks at my radar on his telephone and that's that's his briefing and off he goes. Well, he didn't get any in-flight advisories. He didn't get the METARs and TAFs. Other times he may look at his tablet and get METARs and TAF and think that's it. And then he runs into, well, geez, there was, happens to be an air met for IFR conditions and he wasn't certified for it or icing conditions. So it gets into, we have a hard time documenting that and uh, to kind of say, hey, was it properly, um, was it, did he receive a briefing and then was it properly forecasted? Um, we're getting better and better, but even our weather elements, we still have a problem. When you start talking about severe storms, uh, forecasting of mesoscale convective complexes, derechos, even some supercells, um, we're not there yet. Uh, and talk about ceilings of visibility. Um, weather service still has a problem forecasting the onset of uh, of fog and deteriorating visibility. A lot of the low ceilings and visibility encounters, accidents we see, the weather service um, didn't have an advisory out or it didn't cover the route. Um, or it's like, hey, you got the whole Southeast covered by the advisory, but only a few stations reporting, so they don't pay attention to it. So we've got an issue on properly forecasting, getting a briefing, using the tools, and um in flight getting updates so it, it it's a big it's a big issue and it's something that we have to look at and try to determine to to say hey the the guy did his best to to pre-flight and unanticipated uh flew into the activity uh we do see those every now and then and scott crossfield was a case like that mm -hmm. he got multiple briefings took off and it was a rapidly developing severe weather situation. And he was relying on his storm scope and his briefing that his route should be safe. And it eventually flew into a severe thunderstorm. And ATC watched it right in front of him. So. Well, thanks, Don. Um, and, and thanks to all the panelists. There were up to four minutes till so. Um, I tell you, Jeff, I'll, I'll turn it back to you to, uh, to close it out or have any um, more um, questions for the panelists there. Yeah, thank you uh, for a great panel and a great discussion. Um, if there's no other uh, questions uh, for the panelists, I'll turn it over to anyone from the organizing committee for any final comments uh, before we uh, call it a day. Well, this is Matt, and of course, I always have a comment about everything, but I've been pretty good today about keeping my mouth shut. So, uh, so here we go. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to point out that at last spring's FPA meeting, Janet Ford and Jim Hazeman from the Capital Group spent a full day talking about the pilot briefing process, the improvements that are being um, that, that are being um, introduced into that, and that that notion that Don is talking about about concerning, you know, not not being able to fully understand what a pilot looked at uh, prior to their briefing was among the many topics that were covered. So uh, very timely for that to be brought up again, especially given uh, what we talked about last year. Uh, Mike, uh, Rob, Mark, um, um, gosh, I've forgotten who the fourth was now already. How do you like that? See, Don right in front of me <laughs> thank you for for um for um you know um for, for taking us into the future a little bit to for for looking out ahead um you know you got done with your prepared remarks early enough that i was concerned that we were going to be out early but here we are basically right on time and and certainly there is a, a lot of interest in this in the chat room there's some interesting sidebars going on that while they're not quite as good as the in-person sidebars will be, are still pretty good of, of people making connections, saying we need to talk to one another, we need to get together. Uh, that more than anything else, you know, makes the cockles of my heart, heart warm up. So I, I really like that. Uh, Rob, you and Steve Dar need to have that conversation. Steve knows the ADSB weather stuff inside out, upside down, and and uh, he'll he'll get you all squared away on that. Um, so. One last comment for me, and then I'll hand it over to Matthias. Tomorrow is kind of a recap day, which 
maybe some of you go, oh, my God, I would rather poke myself in the eye with a sharp stick than recap what we've talked about the last three days. But this is an, actually an opportunity, I think, to shape some future work, to shape some future problem areas, because one of the things we're going to talk about is, you know, what do we want to come out of this four day, Tim? What, what sort of a is it a statement? Is it a paper? Is it a position? You know, what what exactly is it? And and so if you're not there to participate tomorrow, you can't help steer that discussion. If you are, you certainly can help steer that discussion. Uh, Bill Bauman, uh, who is the, uh, the the manager of the Aviation Weather Division at the FAA, and, and I will be leading the, those conversations tomorrow. Um, I hope you will join us and, and help us to, to shape this 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 very important topic going forward. And on that note, Matthias, I'll turn it over to you to close us up. Well, well, I'm with the broom behind and uh, get us all out of here. Uh, another great day, a lot of good information and discussions. And so I don't want to use up more time here and just uh, look forward to tomorrow discussions. And I'm not envying uh, Matt and Bill as to what they are pondering this evening and overnight in terms of how to shape the discussion tomorrow. There was so much uh, topics that we touched base on in the last three days. But as Matt said, it, it is an opportunity tomorrow to help shape where this is going. What are we want to take? What, what do we want to take out from this, uh, Tim? And uh, how do we follow up on this? Uh, where is the future going to be? So please join us tomorrow again at 1130 uh, Eastern uh, on the same uh, Teams meeting. So thank you all and goodbye.